hard to follow Victor's talk, uh, so I apologize in advance. Um, but actually, the remarkable thing here is I'm going to talk about a networking company. Those of you who don't know uh, what Aquatel Lucent is, it's a networking company. It builds networks, builds mobile networks, fiber networks, uh, and the systems that control those networks. And soon it'll be called Nokia. Right, we've decided to merge with Nokia. And we didn't do that because we like the Finns. Uh, I'm sure they're very nice. I hear they lot of, eat a lot of reindeer. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that has uh, digestive side effects. But apart from all that, uh, the reason we decided to merge is because our industry is one under pressure. It's under pressure because our value is going elsewhere. Value is being perceived uh, as being elsewhere in big data, uh, in the handset, in your smartphone. And the networks that connect the big data systems, the cloud, and connect your smartphone, those are perceived as having lost value somehow, which is a bit bizarre, frankly. Because if you think about it, everything that Victor said, I can't get the information from the device to the cloud and do the analysis of correlation without a kick-ass network. But the challenge we have, and we do think, by the way, that's all going to renormalize, and I could tell you why, because I think in the end, value appears where, where the constraint is maximal, and I'm going to maybe talk a little bit about how networks are highly constrained and need to be reimagined. And so you're going to see sort of something like the internet era. The internet era, remember the most valuable companies in the world. Two of the top 10 were companies that made network equipment. Cisco was worth $500 billion. A company called Nortel was worth $300 billion. Nortel is worth zero. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and Cisco is actually only worth about 100 million, so it's a, a fifth of its original value. So that was an era, the internet era, where uh, networks were cool, networks got a lot of investment. I think we're going to enter an era where networks get a lot of investment again because of big data and because of devices. And I'll tell, tell you a bit more about that. But the challenge we have as an industry is that no one thinks we're cool anymore. We are unloved. If it's not, if it's still politically correct, we are the bastard children, we are the black sheep, uh, we are the network. And that's not very fun. So I'm going to try and tell you about uh, how I communicate uh, to the customers in our industry, to consumers even, about how the network is cool and fun. Because if you do that correctly, if you do that correctly, then maybe investment reappears. Uh, and maybe you rejuvenate an industry just based on communication, because the facts don't really change. You need to connect the device to the cloud. You need a network to do that. It's indisputable. The strange thing is the perception has gone. And if we can change that perception, money will appear because the logic is irrefutable. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of that story. And I think what you'll find is the interesting part is it resembles Victor's talk. It's nowhere near as good as Victor's talk but it is at least related. So, um, OK, I want to start with the point of uh, this place I run called Bell Labs. Uh, that's not what it looks like anymore. That's where it started in New York City on West Street. And then we moved to the lovely, lovely state of New Jersey, which is where I currently live. Those of you who've been to New Jersey, there's the nice part. And then there's the turnpike. Uh, the turnpike is full of gassy petroleum companies. Everyone thinks that's what New Jersey is like. In fact, you only have to go a few miles away. It's quite beautiful. That's why it's called the Garden State. But nonetheless, this is where Bell Labs is. The interesting part, and I like to remind people uh, about this, is why Bell Labs was founded. And it's the stuff in yellow. I'll read it to you because it's a little bit hard for you to read. It was founded on the premise that uh, there were grand challenges in human communications. If you can actually read it, it says telephone and telegraph. So we're, we're a company that's from the era of the telegraph. We couldn't be less cool in that regard. Uh, but this, from the era of the telegraph and telephone, uh, Bell Labs was founded to actually invent the future. So at each point, it was recognized that you needed to evolve human communications to have, be higher speed, to have better communications, better networking services. So Bell Labs was the innovation engine of the company that was called Western Electric. It became at and it became Alcatel-Lucent, and soon it'll be called Nokia. So 
we have a legacy. We have a legacy of about 90 years. We were founded in 1925, uh, so we're 90th birthday, I guess, this year. But legacy used to mean something good. Your legacy was either what you left behind of value, or it was what someone else left for you that was valuable. Uh, and now legacy has this negative connotation. That's really our problem. Our problem is that the network is considered legacy. Devices are cool, cloud is cool, data is cool, networks are not cool. And there's no good reason why that happened, other than the excess marketing of the device guys, the cloud guys, and in fact, the difficult marketing of data guys, which Victor has just been the best marketeer of big data I've ever seen, but a rational marketer, meaning he's very good at presenting the pros and cons of, of big data. But network is just not cool. It's like the roads. We've become the railways. We've become the roads, which is a bit strange because we've got to completely re reinvent ourselves. Unlike roads that just repave themselves with the same tarmac or railroads that maybe remove a bend so the train can go a little bit faster. Networks are incredibly innovative spaces, constantly rejuvenating themselves and reimagining themselves to connect devices to cloud, yet we are perceived as legacy in the negative sense. And to tell you how cool networks are, I'm going to show you the vision. And the interesting part is it's going to look like Victor's slides. And we did not coordinate that. So there's Tom Cr I mean, there's me. There's me. Uh, it's, of course, Tom Cruise in Minority Report, and you think, well, how does that connect to the vision of a network? I must be really desperate. I just put, up, put up a picture of Tom Cruise. Everyone will like it. Well, so half the audience, or approximately half the audience, will like it. Um, uh, so this is it's the words written above Tom Cruise that you should pay attention to, not Tom Cruise. Uh, the digitization of everything. What we didn't quite touch on in, in Victor's talk is the thing that's changing it was implied there, but to be explicit, the thing that's changing is we're entering an era where we're going to digitize everything. We've digitized data. We've sort of scanned things, and we've had data written in digital format that we could read. But what we haven't done is digitize the physical world. We haven't put sensors on everything. We haven't put uh, modems, cell phone modems, if you like, that communicate on everything. When we do that, when your bike, your car, the road, your UPS good, your shipped package, your whatever it is has a sensor on it. We know where everything is at every point in time. Now, the interesting part is I don't think we need to know what it is in terms of what it's doing. We just need to know where it is, and from that we can actually uh, imply or infer a lot. So one of the things in my talk is I'm going to say I actually believe in big data, but I believe in the anonymized form of big data, which is just where is it and where is it going actually provides an awful lot of valuable information that allows us to achieve perfect knowledge, perfect knowledge in a way that's non-intrusive, and I'll explain that a bit, a bit more. But actually, in the end, not just to deliver personalized content, but this is the goal. The goal is life automation. And I don't think I need to know a lot about you to automate your life, because automation is about fairly simple stuff. And to try and convince you, I'll tell a story of a uh, a presenter I saw when I was a kid. I grew up, as you may tell, uh, in the UK. And we only had three TV channels. We now have five. Uh, no, uh, it's more than that. But uh, on the one TV channel that we all watched, there was a presenter that, uh, that had a trick he did with an audience. He said, just give me three pieces of information about you, uh, and I will tell you everything else about you. And the three he asked for, so of course he did this on the audience, if I was good, I would do it with you, but I don't know anything. Um, your name, your Christian name, your first name, because that gave you uh, your generation. Because Christian names tend to change every 10 years, right? They're, they're in, in fad or they're not. Secondly was your address, and that's pretty obvious. It told him where you lived and whether it was affluent or not so affluent, so it sort of gave you socioeconomic status. And the last was which newspaper you read. Uh, because that would tell you political leanings. And he said, from those three pieces of information, I'm going to predict how many children you have. Do you have a dog? Uh, what, what line of work you're in? You know, are you married or whatever? Uh, and he was relatively accurate, of course, because the trick works. And he said, if you tell me one more thing, do you eat baked beans or not, I'll tell you everything. And I, I don't understand that one, but apparently it's, it's very important. Uh, but the point is, if you think about what I said, it was your name, your address, and the only other thing was which newspaper you read. Now, we have 
that information, the name and address, from a network. Your cell phone moving, I know who you are because I have your name if I'm a network operator because you, you took a, a service from me. I know where you are all the time because I have to do that to allow you to move around. You may not realize, but every time you move, to allow you to move from here to there and still have a cell phone uh, signal, they're tracking you constantly. Cell phone operators know exactly where you are at all points in time. And now with the advent of big data and maps, I can tell what the name of the places you are. And I can tell where you live because I know where you go at the end of the day. And if you keep going there, I can assume you live there. Or you're just lost uh, in the same sort of way. But you can see that just by using location and tracking it and then mapping it to a map, the map says you went to you know, McDonald's or Target or whatever, uh, and, and I know who you go with because I can see people who do the same thing as you repeatedly, I can predict they're your friends or they're your family because they went home with you at night. So I can understand quite a bit without actually knowing the content of what you did. I don't know which movie you watched. I don't know that you bought Pop-Tarts at Walmart. But maybe I don't want to know. Maybe it's good enough that I know that 80%. Because I'm into life automation. I'm not into selling you more Pop-Tarts. I'm not into automating the efficiency of some process. I just want you to have an easier life. And maybe all I need to know for that is where you are, when you, when you went there, and who you went with. And that might actually allow me to automate things. And that's network information. So this is my story about the future of networks, is the network has all that information. And you don't have to give any permission for that. It exists. You give permission just by taking cell phone service. And thanks to all the big data out there, I know where you go because I just look at the map. OK, so that's the story of our vision. I can actually break that down a little bit more. This thing is called Maslow's Hierarchy of Human Needs. As communicators, you probably all know this. Uh, it says what people are after. And I'm going to try and convince you they're after things that allow them to, to appreciate the finer things. And ultimately, that means they're after creating time for themselves. So you see them all. I'm not going to read them. Some of them are a bit naughty. Um, but that's, that's what humans do. As you go higher up, uh, it's, it's about appreciating the finer things in life. And most people who talk about Maslow's hierarchy say it's all about finding time to appreciate those things. Everyone wants to appreciate them. They don't have enough time. One of the funny adaptations to this that my team did is they actually think there's a one below. It's the most important ones at the bottom, the least important at the top, in some ways, in terms of how essential they are to your life. They think this is actually the, the new one. <laughs> below sex and food and water is free Wi-Fi. And I think there's actually some studies that show people have offered to give up all those things uh, in return for free Wi-Fi. <laughs> but the interesting part, we're entering this digital world. And so I, I won't bore you with what uh, is going to be important in the digital world, but there's a couple of important points here. Is in a digital world, networks really matter. Because if I'm existing digitally, if I'm interacting digitally with everything, machines, my processes, my relatives, networks matter. And this is my argument that networks should become cool again, but we have to convince the world of it. And if, it, if you also realize that networks have the information that we're looking for, they're super cool. But I want to come back to the two things at the top. The goal of a digital life is to create time. Think about it. The goal of automating anything is to do it faster or have it done automatically before it, you needed to think about it, it was done for you. And ultimately, that's about creating time. The driverless car isn't cool because it does it. Well, it is for a few minutes. But after that, it's because it allows you to do something else while you were stuck in traffic. It's about creating time for you. Uh, if you think about it, Uber. Uber isn't cool because it disrupted the taxi industry. It's cool because it actually saved you time. The taxi came or the ride came in five minutes. What, what things aren't cool? If you think about it, why I'm going to make a point about this is you can predict the future, not by any data, but just by thinking about it. Your brain matters. Things that aren't cool are things that waste time. Facebook wastes time. It used to save you time because you thought you actually wanted to talk to those people. Then you realize they have nothing interesting to say, or only very few of them have something interesting to say. So you find yourself wasting time on Facebook. And Facebook, I think, is desperately looking for a way to be relevant again and save time. Google, on the other hand, definitely saves time. It does it in, in intrusive ways, 
let's be clear, but it saves you time. So that has intrinsic value. I think it's a way to judge the future. The things that won't matter are the things that save you time. Now, to Victor's earlier point, the only people you will trust to save you time, because you're going to have to give something up. You're going to give up your location. You're going to allow people to track where you are. You're going to maybe even allow them to track the objects you own. You're going to have to have a trust relationship with the one that's going to automate your life. Because they are going to know what you do. They are going to know who you do it with. And if they want to share that with your wife or spouse or the kids, you probably don't want that. So there's a trust relationship, which again says the people you trust most, and if you think about this, it's hopefully true, are actually service providers. You may not always like them because the network may not always have the capacity you want it to have, but you, they've never had a major data breach. They've never actually sold your identity uh, to an advertiser. So often service providers, network providers, are in a position of trust, whereas the Googles of this world are not so much. For those of you who don't remember this or don't use this service, there's a service called Google Now. Uh, very useful service, but it does the following. It reads the attachments to your Gmail. So it doesn't just read your Gmail. When you sign up for this service, it reads the attachments. So it knows where you're going or when you're going on a trip because it read your itinerary. And so when it does that, you then get an alert from Google now saying your flight's about to take off, but there's traffic on the route to the airport, so you should leave earlier. And you think, well, where did that come from? They did, I didn't even tell them I was flying, but they're reading your personal data to provide value to you. I would argue that if you could use a network, if you could use sort of anonymous behavioral data that says every Tuesday you follow this route and that route ends up in an airport, you could have done the same without actually reading your personal data. So that's the argument I'm going to make is that I think you can do a lot just by following location as a function of space and time and who you're with, and that's a much less intrusive way to do that. And that's something a network operator can do, and you trust them. So this is the story of the future of networks. Now, I'm going to talk about a little bit what we're doing. It's all very well to say networks are cool and should be cool, but this is a little bit the section of how I motivate the team to believe it. Because I can't get the Bell Labs team or I can't get our industry motivated unless they really believe in this future. So one of the interesting things we always say, and this is the Bell Labs mantra, is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So to the question earlier, about is the past the right way to see the future? It is sometimes. And in fact, I would argue our legacy, that first, that first slide I showed you about the old building, does help us. It does tell us things not to try because they don't work technologically. But in fact, a lot of the Bell Labs mission is imagine a new reality where it's possible to have infinite connectivity, infinite capacity, zero latency. And that's just pure imagination because it's actually not possible today. There's no data that says it's possible. You have to invent a new phenomena. So uh, we motivate the team by telling them you can invent anything. You just have to think harder and you have to have a diversity of perspective, different nationalities, different disciplines, different genders. All of that comes together to do this. This is what Bell Labs has done. It's not bad. Those are Nobel model medals. So we have eight Nobel Prizes, the last one we won last year. Uh, we have a Grammy, an Emmy, and an Oscar. In fact, I'm told we have two Emmys, but I can't find the second one. So we have, uh, we have that. And we have those things because we actually decided to think differently. We decided to invent a future that no one thought was possible in the network layer or in the systems layer. We invented Unix, we invented C, C++, the laser. We invented cellular communications, the solar panel. We discovered the origin of the, of the universe. You think, what? <laughs> How do we do that? It wasn't by accident. Well, it actually was. Uh, what we were doing is radio communications. And when you try and do radio communications back in the 1940s, we weren't good at it. No one was good at it. The only way of communicating was on copper wires. Uh, so we started these experiments in radio communications, bouncing things. By the way, the thing we bounced it off for was a big balloon. Well, we were <laughs> really good. It was a 10-meter balloon, shiny because that helps with the bouncing part. Uh, so we were doing that between Maine and New Jersey. Uh, and it turns out the signal was so weak, the noise mattered. There was something hissing in the background. And, and because we had some really smart people from around the world look at it, in the end they figured out it wasn't the pigeon droppings, which is actually what they first thought, 
because the antenna looks like a sort of bird's nest in some way. So pigeons love to, to live in the antenna. Uh, and they thought the bird's droppings were causing this hiss. Uh, in the end, they figured out it was actually the hiss of the, microwave, of the microwave background, which is the first emission of light or radiation from the Big Bang. It just gets shifted over time, it gets weaker and weaker, and they were hearing the origin of the universe. So that's the type of thing Bell Labs does. It, it goes so far into investigating why, trying to do something that's impossible. At the time, radio communications was impossible. But we go so far, we win these prizes. And that's amazing. And we continue to do that. So when I remind the team of this, and they didn't do it just for fun, they did it to solve real world problems, and those real world problems are about the future of humankind, they get really excited. There's a little bit of this story I'm just going to share, is there's an exact parallel between physical delivery networks and digital delivery networks, because I'm going to argue that we're moving from a world where physical delivery matters to digital delivery. So it's not just that we're connecting everything, we are going to try and digitize every single thing we possibly can, and then recreate it at the edge. The other part of digital is 3D printing. If I can recreate something at home or, or maybe just locally with a 3D printer, suddenly I'm not shipping anything. I save all that cost of producing remotely and shipping and, and an inventory in a factory or a warehouse, and I reproduce it locally, and I produce it perfectly. It's not just perfect knowledge, it's perfect production, because I only produce it when I need it, and there's no excess. It's almost the perfect environmental uh, solution as well. And we'll do that because we can. And you think, okay, doesn't sound likely, does it? But then there's a company in the UK, two women started a doll company, and they 3D print dolls. Now, everyone knows that dolls are made in China and Taiwan, or Hong Kong. This company 3D prints them in, in, uh, in the UK. And so that's a big change. And that's all because we're moving to a digital world from uh, a physical world, and we're reproducing goods locally. So this is the sort of where I'll wrap up. The conundrum we have is we exist in an industry where we've got a brand associated with legacy. We've got a brand associated with invention, but we can't seem to communicate it correctly. And what we do, though, is we actually increasingly connect those two. The legacy brand, Alcatel-Lucent, we are, are connecting with the invention brand more and more. And by doing that, we're actually sort of rejuvenating our industry. You'll see us talk a lot about Bell Labs in our industry. And it's actually because it's the brand of creativity, of invention, of Nobel Prizes. And it's the way we've chosen to go back to the industry and say, it is cool to be us. It is cool to be in the network layer because we're in the middle of everything connecting those devices to the cloud. So at the end of my presentation, they asked me, what does it take to give a good presentation? Uh, and I found this. <laughs> it's, this is what it takes. Uh, engage, connect, and persuade. Actually, I hope that my answer is you have to have a compelling story. And even in our industry, uh, we tell compelling stories so we feel better about ourselves because we're in that sort of negative space. It has to be credible. There actually has to be defensible data in it, and it can't just be fluff. You have to be able to prove your point, and then you have to be charming, and the only advantage I have there is I have an accent. <laughs> but find a way to have uh, some level of charm. So that's, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, I hope you see our industry in a different light now, uh, but understand the role communications plays in telling that story, because nothing changed other than the communications.